So I invite uh, Joseph to come uh, to give his uh, talk. I ask him to introduce himself, and then uh, you have uh, 20 minutes presentation, five minutes questions, and five minutes for changing rooms. Thank you. As you can see, this is my first Frost 4G. I I'm excited about it, and I'll pack just a t-shirt and shorts for Calgary next year, I hope. <laughs> so I'm here to, I'm coming from Vermont. They look, are you all set? Yes. <laughs> Yes, because uh, people no, want no. to see the, the screen. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, technical issues. Okay, so I'm coming from Vermont, a small liberal arts college, uh, Middlebury College in Vermont, and my intellectual project over the last few years there has been trying to integrate critical human geography theory with GIS technical courses. And I started at the higher level and then over the last year brought it back down um, right from the introductory level. So the title of my talk is Human Geography with Open GIS a transformative introductory higher education course. So I frame this talk sort of as a response to some of the reviews that I got from a paper just published digitally this summer, the DOIs right there. Um, and this is also on a github.com slash GIS for development in the repository for FOSS4G 2019, if you want to download the slides rather than taking photographs. And this paper was about the advanced level course. And some of the response I got to that from skeptical human geographers was, okay, you're using open source GIS, but isn't GIS still just a capitalist, imperialist, military, industrial, instrumentalist, surveillance technology tool, even though it's open source, how is that so different from the proprietary stuff that we've been using all along? And from more sympathetic reviewers, I got questions like, can we really try to do this at the introductory level with you know, novice students? And can a course really meaningfully integrate critical theory with GIS techniques at the introductory level and kind of meaningfully change GIS in any way? And this talk will kind of present to you some of the incremental ways in which I feel like the class really has been transformative. And so to kind of frame this for folks that aren't familiar with this conflict, at least in United States geography, on the human geography side, you have the radical Marxists, relativists, qualitative folks, people doing postmodern theory. And that camp kind of generally rejects all GIS in any form. And on the right hand side, GIS is more or less the black box of a corporate uh, version of proprietary software kind of seen as capitalist, um, logically positivist, um, and so on and so forth. And so what I'm trying to do here is create something new and integrative for undergraduate students that is human geography with open GIS, where GIS is presented as multiple possible GIS softwares that are accessible because it's open source and free, that they're malleable because you can fork them and change them. Um, the transparent code can be seen from a critical point of view as a text and a history of the social context of development of this technology. Um, and that technology, because it's malleable and open, can maybe better support critical research from the left-hand side of the divide. And so I'm proposing that the GIS lab, when you start teaching this way, becomes a site of transformation of curricula, of software, and of students themselves. 
So how is the curricula transformed? I'll present to you a little bit about the course in terms of its learning goal, its flow, um, the types of work that students have produced, and the way I evaluate. So my learning goals in the course are to understand and apply fundamental concepts in human geography and spatial analysis, understand and apply, apply and critique a range of thematic problems and applications of GIS in human geography, so kind of political, human, um, urban, hazards, you know, all the kind of themes of human geography. Develop skills interpreting and critiquing evidence, including spatial data. Solve problems independently by choosing the best methods and in interpreting results, so independent problem solving. Gaining familiarity with GIS and learning new GIS techniques. And appreciating problems of error, uncertainty, and ethics in GIS. Um, many of these, if you're familiar with typical GIS curricula, are topics that are not present at all or barely mentioned. So the flow of the course, let's start at the top. Um, on a Thursday, I would introduce a new sub-discipline in human geographies that might be urban geography or political or hazards or so on and so forth. Over the weekend, I will give students a recorded video tutorial where they work through a simple example, typically so simple that they could actually digitize the features along with me on the screen and then try running some operations on those features. And also over the weekend, they would read one paper which would apply that GIS technique in a critical way. Then on Tuesday in class, we'll review the concepts that we kind of learned in the tutorial and make sure those are all solid and start talking about how you would combine those GIS techniques to solve the types of problems that they were addressing in the methodology in the paper that we read over the weekend. Then in lab, we'll actually transfer that problem to a new context. So just for example, if we read a paper that was studying patterns of segregation in Milwaukee, we would then move over to Chicago and students with me would kind of work through that problem in the lab. At the beginning of Thursday, we'd critique and interpret the findings and the methods from that lab and then move into a new subdiscipline. So we'd go through this cycle a couple of times, and then after three weeks or so, we'll break, and I'll give them an independent problem, and I'll show an example of what that might be uh, in a couple of slides. So to give you an idea how this is really possible, I'll show what I did in the first week and a half of the course. So it's a slightly modified schedule because of not starting on a Thursday, but just follow along. So starting at the top, um, and in the very first class, I introduced what is human geography, what is GIS, what is cartography, like those big ideas. Then they read before lab a paper by Kitchen from 2002, which was a participatory mapping of disabled access in an, envir uh, an urban environment. Uh, the critical aspect of that paper is the fact that it's participatory and it's trying to map disabled access, not the type of thing you normally see on Google Maps or a uh, campus map or something like that. Then in lab, students work together to create a data schema that would allow them to create a map similar to the one that they read. They implement that in Google Forms, and then they go out on campus with mobile phones and fill in the data of points that they observe on campus representing disability access. On Thursday, we go over some of the more fundamentals of measuring location using GPS, what is place and what is space, like these fundamental human geography and GIS concepts. Over the weekend, they do a video tutorial in which they download the data they created in the Google form, um, and they learn how to visualize that in QGIS. They learn the Q quick OSM plugin to pull in data from OpenStreetMap, and they learn some uh, simple visualizations. They also read over the weekend a critical cartography introduction by Jeremy Crampton in his 2010 book. Um, and then on Tuesday, we talk about the fundamentals of cartographic design. Then finally, in the next lab, so this is only a week and a half now, they follow some video tutorials and then branch out on their own to uh, kind of create their own disability maps of the campus that they live on. So here's an example of a product after week 1.5. And you can see that students are already learning to adapt data schemas to the environment around them. So they're adding symbols and data points for winter hazards that they didn't see in the paper they read. And they're mapping handicapped entrances and they're finding that oftentimes the entrances on campus are actually blocked during the winter season. They're not plowed or they're too icy to traverse in a wheelchair. 
Uh, they're finding patterns in time and space. They're often writing about historic buildings having less access. And they're finding that important student life functions are often found in the buildings that students cannot access. So this built environment is adversely impacting the lives that students can live on campus. On a higher order level, they're also thinking more, more um, theoretically based on the papers we read and talking about things like maps being socially produced, um, recognizing that as critical students and critical cartographers, even in an intro, intro, introductory course, um, they can start repurposing maps for more radical purposes. Um, and that means that their maps that they are creating have the power to change the perception of space of campus and can be sent and are sent to administrators to try to argue for changing the built environment itself. It's a very different view of GIS from an introductory level that students are getting in an active way, right? So then we break for an exam and just an example of what the type of work that students might do. Um, after reading papers on urban geography, uh, around structure of the city and segregation and urban political ecology, kind of mapping um, political uh, environmental justice on top of patterns of segregation. I give them a question, is Houston, Texas segregated? And if it is segregated, is there evidence of environmental injustice when it comes to temperature, surface temperature? So along with that question, they get two data sets. Census data from 2010 loaded with race, racial information and uh, surface temperature derived from the Landsat 7 satellite on September 6, 2000. And they're essentially given that question for a week to come up with a solution on their own, create maps and graphs that uh, articulate the findings that they've gotten and write up short captions or essays to explain their results by citing theory. So in four different ways, I think I've transformed curricula from what you normally see, at least in the United States, which is um, they're learning human geography theory actively by applying it through um, open GIS methods. They're learning GIS concepts and techniques, but they're not just the techniques. They're in this wrapper of um, critical human geography thought. They're learning to pose GIS problems um, and solve them and interpret them with theory, not just producing the map that's right or wrong, but discussing what that map means. And they're starting to bridge the divide between subdisciplines and epistemologies in geography that even old time professors are kind of unwilling to touch. <laughs> so the curricula has transformed, has the software itself also transformed? Um, I'd argue that there, I've been changing GIS in very incremental ways, modestly <laughs> incremental ways, in four different ways. Um, sometimes I'm changing the software a little bit for teaching and pedagogical reasons. Sometimes I'm just trying to simplify the software a little bit to make it easier and more accessible to those novice students. Um, sometimes I'm debugging the software as I run into things while developing instructional materials because of the way I develop them. And sometimes students themselves, because of the way I've taught them, um, are identifying bugs, telling me about them, and then I'm reporting them on GitHub. So examples of pedagogical reasons. Um, for that activity of mapping disability on campus, I wanted students to get a sense of what mobile, mobile phones are collecting and streaming in terms of location services. So I just created a simple leaflet map to expose all those services in a, in a panel down below. And then they used this to then fill out um, the Google form on a second sheet. Um, I couldn't find any simple app that just did this, reported coordinates and all the, the GIS data streams on top of an open street map. So I uh, programmed one myself and made it available to students. I also wanted them to be creative in their selection of symbology for that accessibility map. And I found the, 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 the icons available in open in, um, sorry, in QGIS to be a little bit too limited for that activity at first. So I wanted to pull the Maki icons from Mapbox into QGIS to broaden that array of uh, symbology, which I found I could actually do pretty simply by just forking the Maki icon library, editing the SVG code a little bit to talk to the QGIS symbology engine, and um, then writing a batch script to send that into uh, the QGIS application directory on, in our labs. So this is an image of uh, Maki icon being displayed with the you know, Symbology engine in QGIS. 
sometimes a theory that we were reading kind of demanded a particular type of visualization that I wasn't able, able to ex easily access in QGIS. So one good example of that is, you know, Hoyt's sector theory talks about race and housing prices by the direction away from the central business district in a city. So what I wanted to be able to do is use a data plotly polar plot, um, kind of mimicking the directions of a compass, where the x variable would be the direction around the central business district and the y or independent variable would be rent or race or something else like that. So this is actually showing data from uh, Chicago in 2010 and zero is zero degrees north, 180 is 180 degrees south. And so it just took a little bit of editing of the data plotly plugin uh, with a pull request to reverse its direction and change the way it was mapping X and Y to be able to show that. Um, in terms of simplifying stu things for students, um, in translating from ArcGIS to QGIS in the introductory curriculum, there were two big stumbling blocks. The biggest one, honestly, was the lack of robust dissolve tools in QGIS. Like, as more technical people, we know we can just ex execute some SQL, um, use stmakevalid to take care of the geometry errors that we've gotten from intersecting and unioning before that step, um, and we can use group by and sort of work out the dissolve through SQL, right? But for novice, um, even very smart novice students, that's a big ask to then sort of jump to another programming language just for one function, right? And it's too distracting for an introductory course to ask them to do that. Um, so I just used Graphic Modeler to quickly prototype a couple of things. Um, one was a dissolve tool that executed that SQL for them. Um, so that tool does what I could not find in any other dissolve tool in open source, which was it was robust against geometry errors. It could group by zero, one, or many fields, and it could summer, generate multiple summary statistics for multiple numerical fields. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't find that in the core GIS algorithms anywhere. Um, Another thing was distance and direction. Again, this was to support the study of urban structure. And it was just too tricky to use the field calculator to refer to data in another field while calculating azimuth and distance um, in QGIS. So just create a model for students to be able to do that and kind of move on, get the big bang for the buck in terms of the learning goals without all the hassle of the syntax of a really complicated um, algorithm in field calculator. Then it comes to the debugging part. Um, so those tutorials over the weekend, they have to be really simple so that students can see at a fundamental level what the data structures in GIS are doing and what the algorithms in GIS are doing, right? So those really simple examples also have to show the edge cases or boundary cases that you would also use as a programmer when you're trying to debug a, a new algorithm, right? So this spring, you know, I only wanted to make one change in the class from the fall semester to the spring semester, and that was I wanted to start using the GeoPackage file format. That change cost me a couple of weekends of my life <laughs> because in creating those, in re-recording those uh, videos, I found that um, the core vector processing algorithms in Q were assuming that the FID it was getting from a previous GeoPackage layer had unique integers. And so everything after that first value was getting dropped out of the analysis. It wasn't generating errors, it just was dropping uh, data out of the outputs. Um, similarly, some of the dissolve functions with, with uh, the buffer tool were violating geometry type constraints depending on if there were single parts and multi parts mixed in the same output, um, causing really un unpredictable results. And so once I figured those things out, I reported them as bugs and then spent another you know, half a day trying to figure out what's the best way that I can show students to work around this while the programmers are still fixing it um, in QGIS development, um, which I did to some frustration. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, what I'm saying is teaching in open source GIS does have some costs in terms of the bugginess of it. Um, but as long as you're putting all the effort into creating these teaching materials and you're doing it in a way that is good at debugging, I figure I might as well do service to the community back, submit the bug reports, and I'm happy to say that all of these things I'm talking about right now are already fixed in the version of QGIS you download today. Uh, kind of found some other similar types of issues when I was 
working with a QNEAT3 plugin, which I do recommend for teaching because it's a real easy way to access network and analytical tools uh, without all the startup costs of really complicated network data type construction and all that jazz. Um, there are some things that still need to be worked out with it though. And this is a case where teaching students to be really observant of the numbers of records and descriptive statistics at each step and kind of analyzing their results to make sure that they're correct to self check their work during independent problems paid dividends because they are the ones that noticed that the OD matrix was missing one record every time. You know, how often do you check the number of records you get from an OD matrix type <laughs> operation, right? There are thousands and thousands of them here. Um, uh, there are exponential numbers of them, in fact. Uh, but they were carefully checking that and they're like, I think there's one missing and I hear that from three students and then I start to think there's probably actually something wrong here. So I looked into it, submitted a bug report. By the end of the exam they were doing, the bug had already been fixed. Um, and so that was a, a thanks to that um, developer, I forget his name right now, but the turnaround was just six days to get that resolved. Um, and so kind of, I think it's about time to conclude, so this is good timing. Is all this work also kind of transforming the types of students that we're producing in the curricula? I think that it actually is. Um, one major difference is that we're trying to set, set the stage for students to be able to go on and do independent research. Independent research requires being able to ask good geographic questions that are theoretically grounded and match those questions to the types of data and techniques that you need in open source to solve those problems, which we're practicing from an introductory level here. I also think I'm producing better GIS analysts. I'll admit, in trying to do all this, they do not cover as much ground in different GIS techniques as you might in a course that wasn't trying to do this. They cover less technical ground, but I think they cover that ground better. Um, they, because they're being aware of subjectivity, error, and uncertainty in all of their an analysis. They're developing independent problem solving skills. They're developing strategies to recognize errors and debug them. And uh, once they get their results, that's not the end of the story for them. They're interpreting that problem with results in theory. The next bullet point you should be all very sympathetic to in a phosphor G audience, I think. We're also creating students that have independence and freedom. They're not tied to the pr pr proprietary GIS license, right? They are ready to go on and be entrepreneurs, uh, to work for nonprofit and grassroots organizations and their internships and first jobs after college. Um, and it, I think it's a better gateway into the data science um, than, than the, uh, the proprietary software is because they're learning little snippets of code here and there and kind of the tools that they would need for data science later on. So just to remind you, if you're interested in some of the specific things I've been developing here or finding the slides um, on GitHub, the organization for the upper level course where I'm putting all this stuff is GIS for dev, GIS for development, um, and there's my email address and happy to take some questions. Yeah, okay. No. Thanks a lot. There's some really exciting stuff you're doing there. So congratulations for that work. Yeah. I was just wondering on the practical side, I didn't really understand, you have two theoretical classes per week plus one lab, plus then the time that they spend right. during the weekends and whatever. So let's say if you want to estimate the number of hours that this class takes the students, how much would that be? Right, so the, there are two lecture periods. Those are each one hour, 15 minutes. Um, over the weekend, the video tutorial should be about an hour, um, not much more, sometimes an hour ten, um, and one reading over the weekend. And then the lab section is three hours. Uh, it's, we have 12 week semesters, so it's, um, it's intense. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. I have uh, one for you. It's uh, congratulations. It's very nice presentation and uh, very nice work. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, my question is: uh, 
how do you organize uh, practically also the labs? Uh, all the people have the same PC or uh, because uh, when I teach, mm. students have their own laptop. And this brings me a lot of efforts because not everything is working the same on every uh, version of Windows and things like that. How do you handle this? Yeah, no, we, um, we use all the same machines in a computer lab. I do tell students that they can try to set it up on their own computers. We have a Windows lab. I've noticed that some things work a little bit differently if you install the same software on the Mac OS, which most students have. Um, it, most things work OK in that different uh, operating system environment, but they do run into a couple of problems. And I'm kind of like, I'm already doing too much for this class, and so if you want to go off on your own, like you're kind of on your your own if you want to use your own machine. Other questions? Yeah, maybe to, as a follow-up uh, to what you just said, how much time does it take you to do this as a, as a, as a teacher? And let's say how much is, let's <laughs> yeah. say, intensive investment at the beginning, but then you think you can reuse for the next five years, and so it's, 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 it's maybe worth investing at right. the beginning. Right. Yeah, I'm really, <laughs> it takes too much time. Like, you would think that just the best example I can think of is the geo package switch, like moving from shapefile to geo package. I think that's a really trivial thing, and then it ends up taking quite a lot of time to figure out exactly what the errors were inside GIS, submit the bug report, figure out a workaround, deliver that to students, and so on. So uh, as much as... The QGIS development can stabilize uh, with these kind of core algorithms. I think that will save me a lot of time in the future. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about ways to mitigate the loss of time. I'm happy to do that. Like, and in some sense, focusing on concepts first is really helpful because all of that that material is timeless. And so then, what you have to adapt as software changes is the implementation part of that. So if you have good uh, like scripts for the video tutorials at a conceptual level, translating those into different software changes is not so bad. And then you're really just talking about like an hour and a half to sit down and do it on do a new version each weekend. Very last question because. We Yeah, I'm just around, so feel free to come up and ask questions. Sir.